Good morning. The last chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, and uh, we'll get through part of it then today. I think, what have we got here? This was, uh, this was a hundred, this is the 134th study of the book of Revelation. So Lloyd Jones would be proud of us for not rushing through this, right? Um, I wanted to, I can't remember if I told you about this book or not, but I it would do it. It doesn't really have anything to do with Revelation. Well, it does, but anyway, um, it's called The Saboteur. You can get it on Amazon, right? Lady's name is Freya Parson that wrote it. The subtitle is Detecting and Dealing with Wolves in Sheep's Clothing in the Church. And it's very good. Um, so this is a lady that obviously has been through a lot of experience, as we have, with wolves in sheep's clothing. So the saboteur, that's a, that would be a good one to read, all right. So, uh, okay, then, um, well, <laughs> yeah, it is about revelation in that sense, because the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing, as we've seen, is uh, the dragon and the beast and the false prophet who deceives Satan, deceives the nations and so forth. But, well, let's pray, and then we'll get into this chapter 22. Father, we come now to the culmination of this book of Revelation. We thank you for it. We thank you for encouraging us with these words and making us wise in regard to your truth and, uh, and, and better equipped to stand against the lies and deceptions of the enemy. We pray, Father, that this last chapter would be used to your glory and honor and to the building up of your people and your church. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, then. Well, I'm going to primarily be using Simon Kistemacher's book here this morning, Simon Kistemacher. Um, he was, I don't know if I ever mentioned that to you or not, but he was a professor at Reform Theological Seminary in Florida that's uh, affiliated with R.C. Sproul and so on. But he lived from... Uh, 1930 to 2017. So he's already seen a lot of what uh, he wrote about here in this commentary of Revelation. And by the way, he so he was part of that seminary. They started that seminary because of uh, a liberalism creeping, false teaching creeping into the Presbyterian church. And so conservative, Bible-believing pastors and theologians got together and, and founded that seminary, which is still in existence today. All right, well, let's look at this. Um, first of all, note that the first, you'll see as I read these, the first five verses, you can see there's a division here. The ESV at verse 6 puts another heading in, Jesus is coming. But for the first five verses, it's called the river of life. So the first five verses here actually connect with, they could have div divided the chapter that way, with chapter 21, describing the new heaven and the new earth, and specifically the new Jerusalem, okay, in the last part of chapter 21. So um, uh, at any rate, that's where we still are in that sense. So let's look at these first five verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And, and by the way now, notice as we go through chapter 22, we've seen it before, but um, the, I, the emphasis upon the deity of Christ and the oneness of of the Father and the Son. So you see this river of life, bright as crystal, is flowing from the throne, one throne, the throne 
of God and of the Lamb. All right, there. Um, that's the mystery of the of the Trinity. There. Anyway, it flows through the middle of the street of the city. Transparent gold. Remember. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. See, there it is again. The throne, one throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. All right then, so the river of life and the tree of life. Here's a little introductory comment by Kistemacher here. John here has in mind the words from Isaiah 52, 1. O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. And so we're still talking about, well, you remember uh, chapter 21 ended this way, right? Nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And remember, the New Jerusalem is what? It's the church. It is the church. And here, the New Jerusalem, this is the true church. No longer anybody in a church, the church, that is unclean or does what's detestable or false. It's only the the people of God, all right? So that's how chapter 21 ended. And, uh, and that's why he, he is saying here that John has in mind from Isaiah 52, 1, O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. The writer of Revelation specifies in another passage what he includes in unclean. An unclean person who practices detestable things, has as companions sorcerers, fornicators, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices deceit. Those who speak deceitfully have Satan as their father, and they are all excluded from God's kingdom. By contrast now, he's, uh, he's just winding up chapter 21, those people whose names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life are free to enter the holy city. They possess life eternal and belong to their faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lamb who bought them with his blood will never blot out their names from his book and will grant them the right to the tree of life and entrance into the city. And that brings us then to chapter uh, 22 here. So the angel showed me the river of the water of life brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then in verse 22, the uh, tree of life. Now, the big picture here is that Genesis, before the fall, before sin ever entered the world, Garden of Eden, has been restored, okay, by, by the time these events happen here, when we see Christ face to face, Christ has come again. But well, let's talk about it this way. The Bible begins and ends in Eden. That's the big picture of the Bible. I, I have no doubt that many, if not most, professing Christians don't know that. Um, I, I've known, well, I didn't know that for, for a long time. The, the first, I think, the first time that I um, was made aware of that was in uh, one of the good uh, seminary classes that I took on biblical theology 
And I think I've actually mentioned this before, but that uh, the professor gave us an assignment. Go home over the weekend and find references and symbols, things, people, whatever, references in Revelation that, are, that connect with Eden. In other words, find Eden in Revelation. And so we did that, and, and you become aware of, oh, wait a minute here. The Bible is a unity. It begins in Eden, and it ends in Eden, Eden restored, and even Eden surpassed, because this Eden, the new Eden, can never, nobody's ever going to sin. There, nobody, the, the serpent is never going to show up. There, he's already then in the in the lake of fire by that time, so that's the big picture. That's really important. I mean, just think about that. The Bible opens up Genesis first uh, one, two, and into three before Adam and Eve eat the fruit, um, and uh, but it opens up in Eden. Eden is what creation is supposed to be. It's what it's, it's, what it's supposed to be. Um, I've got a book here somewhere. I always think of these books, and then I have to dig them out. Verla's going to help me build some new bookshelves today over here. Um, but to get these up here, but I, this one book in particular, Graham Gold's, Goldsworthy, uh, that's G.K. Beale. I'm digging in my uh, biblical... Oh, here we go. This is it. Um, Graham Goldsworthy. According to plan. According to plan. The unfolding revelation of God in the Bible. Okay? And it says down below, an introduction to biblical theology. Biblical theology is, is this kind of a thing. It's tracing a theme in the Bible from beginning to end. And you see the importance of this. If you don't understand that the Bible begins and ends in Eden, you don't really understand everything in between, right? You don't, you don't understand that. What is God's plan of redemption? Why did Christ come and die for our sins? Why is it just so we can go to heaven? Well, that's that's part of it, but the, it, it is, it's God's entire plan in Christ to take back what Satan deceived, what was lost, paradise lost. Par who was that? Milton or somebody wrote that paradise lost, paradise regained, whatever. And, uh, and so then you have here, lo and behold, in the last book of the Bible, it's full of of uh, images from Eden, and we've seen them before here in, in Revelation. So that's, that's the big picture. You really can't interpret things in between properly if you don't understand that, if you don't, if you don't get the beginning and the end, right? I, I think that this is related to when Jesus says things like, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? I'm the creator in the first place, and I'm the creator of the new creation as well, right? So, okay, all those, all those themes are here. And so in that sense, it shouldn't surprise us that Eden shows up, and it shows up big time here in the very last chapter of the Bible. The river of the water of life, brightest crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So now there's a lot there in just those two verses. We might not even get further than that. But okay, here's some more comments then on this from Gestemacher. The first five verses of chapter 22, and we've noted this, are part of the preceding section and not part of the conclusion, which is verses 6 through 21. Uh, those first five verses belong to the description of the New Jerusalem 
where from God's throne a life-giving river flows forth with the tree of life along its banks. And by the way, this probably already noted this, but, um, you know, you see, you, uh, here's a question that we need to answer um, in verse 2. How can the tree of life be on both sides of the river? Is it this tree that, you know, the roots are like one of those big banyan trees or something in the one side? Well, that's not it. And, and we'll see the explanation then of that um, pretty, pretty soon. So in this section, we are the concluding references to the throne of God in the city, God dwelling among and with his people, all right? The cessation of night, there's no night there. There's no cycle of day and night. It's timeless. The new creation is eternal. It's timeless. When John is going to talk in verse 2 about the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, right? He's just using each month. Well, that sounds like there's going to be time and a calendar there, but that's not the case in eternity. He's just drawing on um, things that we know uh, about, like months, uh, to try to communicate these, these things to us then. Um, so, here is a picture, he says, of the new Garden of Eden. God's revelation, the Bible, begins with Adam and Eve in paradise, with the tree of life and a river to water this garden. Remember, there was a tree, there was a river that watered the garden of Eden. And furthermore, obviously, there were trees, right? Uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's where Adam and Eve got into trouble, got us into trouble. Actually, we got into trouble ourselves because, you know, that's the doctrine of original sin. In Adam... We sinned, right? And uh, just as in Christ, we are, we are made alive. But God's revelation begins with Adam and Eve in paradise with the tree of life and a river to water this garden. And his revelation continues with a picture of the redeemed people in that renewed garden with the tree of life. There won't be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil there. Um, with the tree of life and the river of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. In other words, Kistemacher goes on, this is heaven on earth, right? The new Jerusalem has come down, the new heavens and the new earth, is, as Christ's church, his people, inherit the place prepared for them in the, on the new earth. This is heaven on earth. In a few lines... Uh, of poetry, an anonymous author expressed the thought that being with Jesus is heaven indeed. And here's this little, these little verses here, entitled Heaven. The light of heaven is the face of Jesus. And we've seen that, right? There's no night there. I uh, don't need a, need a sun and the moon because the Lamb and God and the Lamb are the, are the light there. The light of heaven is the face of Jesus. The joy of heaven is the presence of Jesus. <clears throat> the melody of heaven is the name of Jesus. The employment of heaven is the service of Jesus. The harmony of heaven is <clears throat> the praise of Jesus. The theme of heaven is the work of Jesus. And apparently they don't know who the person is that wrote those lines, but they're, they're excellent. Paul put it candidly, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. You know this verse. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And that's what this is all about. I put a little note on the side there that Kistemacher died in 2017, so he's absent from the body and present with the Lord. And all the stuff that he wrote about here in uh, his commentary on Revelation, he's He's, he's seeing, well, not all of it. It hasn't been come to full culmination yet, but he's, he has seen a lot more than, than we have. Well, all right then. <clears throat> Here's this river in the new creation, in, and I guess you'd say the new Jerusalem. This river 
<coughs> of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, what have we got here? Now, remember, this is all, these things are all symbols given to John in this vision to communicate to us realities about the new heavens and the new earth and our dwelling place there as the New Jerusalem, as the bride of Christ, the people of God, the church, all right? These are symbols. Thing. In other words, <clears throat> we are not meant to think that um, what we're going to see when this happens is a giant cube 1,500 miles square, <clears throat> a city, multi-level, and uh, with a literal... A tree of life and a literal um, river flowing through it. Now, could there be trees and rivers and so on in the new creation? Well, absolutely. I mean, the first Eden had that. But in this case here, <clears throat> this river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, these kinds of things are meant to not just tell us that, okay, in the new creation, there's going to be trees and, and streams and so on. It's, it's, it's communicating to us a much deeper reality. And what is it? It's eternal life. Unending. It's proceeding. From God, from the throne of God and the Lamb, it gushes forth life. When Christ came, John chapter 1, he was, we, John called him the life and light of men, right? And this relates back to uh, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. You've probably already uh, thought of that. Um, Jesus, here's Kistemacher, Jesus offered the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, what? Living water, John chapter 4. <clears throat> Living water. Well, what was that living water? It's the Holy Spirit. Um, just as water, in a sense, is the essence of life, giving life, then um, um, the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates us and, and gives life, in this case, life eternal. So, um, so you that that those are the kinds of things, and e even the tree, the tree of life, yielding its fruit each month, twelve kinds of fruit, right for the healing of the nations and so on. All of that language is talking about eternal life, the absolute removal of death. Um, that little phrase there, in verse two two. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Is a little problematic, as Kistemacher notes, because it's like, well, wait a minute. Are the nations going to need, still need to be healed? Healed from what? I mean, I thought there wasn't going to be anything bad at all. Well, there isn't. There's no disease. There's no anything else. So this language is speaking about the, the healing that Christ has done for, and why does it say the nations? For every people, right? In Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You know, everybody is in, in Christ. So this, all of this language, this water from the throne of God and the Lamb, this tree, and it, what's the tree? It's a tree of life. It, <clears throat> it's, it's telling us, these images are telling us that in the new heavens and the new earth, there is only life. And, and that life is eternally given to us by God and, uh, and the Lamb. And there's no death there in any way, shape, or form. It's also speaking to us of what else? The absolute removal of the curse. All semblance of the curse 
any of it is, uh, is gone. You haven't lived a single second in your life in a world, in a creation that is not under the curse. You haven't, not a single, I mean, so many aspects of life in this world are a result of the curse. Turn on the news. Huh. Does it make you feel good? Uh, that's all the curse work, working its way out. Wars and homicides and, and plagues and you name it. Even things that we consider, we think of as normal. Oh, I got a cold today. It's kind of miserable. Well, that's, that's part of the curse. Um, when your pets die, you know, the, a dog that you love and so forth, and maybe after 12 or 15 years they die, that's the curse. All, everything. I, I suppose you could say even when you look out, like right now we look out the window here and we see the trees leaf starting to leaf out it's springtime right and but eventually at the end of summer and into fall all those leaves are going to die and and fall off and so um there there's so many aspects of of the curse through and through everything and and to think of and there's so many aspects of the curse that we don't we don't even we grow accustomed to them and don't even realize that that's part of how about interpersonal conflicts that we have? sin itself and i mean there's the there's the root cause right um economics in the new heavens and the new earth christ's invitation to us is come and buy without money and without price but now there's this thing called poverty and uh and the the experience of people not even having enough to eat there's tsunamis there's tornadoes and hurricanes there's droughts crop failures all of the all of those kinds of things you go out in berlin our daughter or, or working on planting a garden well if you're going to plant a garden you have to take steps against various creatures and fungus and so forth that would destroy the garden so everything that we labor by the sweat of our brow and so we we cannot even imagine the life that God has prepared for us in Christ that's coming, that's being communicated at, as best can be communicated to us here in the book of, Re of Revelation. Um, no crying, no death, no sorrow, no pain. Gone, right? Gone. And so there's the, there's the promise. Um, and, and it's certain, and by the way, Another thing that you'll see in chapter 22 is a repeated authentication of the entire book of Revelation, if not the whole Bible. So there will be things like, um, I, John, testify to the truth of these things, or Jesus himself steps in and, and endorses it. Um, the angel s says this too, emphasizing that these promises are true. Now, of course, now, now look, here's the catch. This is, this is why it's such a great mistake and a sad one for Christians to approach the book of Revelation in an argumentative way. And they're, really their only purpose is, so often is to uh, try to use the book of Revelation to prove their particular take on it okay so it's like you got so the futurist is going to say that from chapter four on say in revelation virtually everything hasn't happened yet it's all in the future we disagree with them as you know we we are 
take an amillennial approach and say that um, the majority of the book of Revelation, in fact, describes the present church age and, and what's happening. Now, not all of it. There's some like this one here in the future when uh, the culmination of the new heavens and the new earth. But it really is true. People, if you approach the book of Revelation that way as well, I'm going to show you that my take on Revelation is the right one. You can, you can go into all kinds of detail that way and come up not having the foggiest notion what it's all really all about. It's the restoration of Eden. It is the restoration of Eden. Those are the things that, <clears throat> that really matter. The throne is right <clears throat> at the middle of all of this. It's where eternal life from the Lord comes from. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of Old Testament background here in these images. <clears throat> For instance, now we've already said that back in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 is this detailed description, including the measuring and surveying of it, of the new of the temple. And people differ on I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing to interpret, but people differ on, well, what is this temple? Is it, was it supposed to be the rebuilt temple after the Babylonian captivity? Is it the, uh, some kind of millennial temple or, you know, what is it? But there are great correlations between revelations talking about the temple and what Ezekiel has to say. So, for instance, if we go back here to Ezekiel and uh, look at, what is it, verse 47 here. Ezekiel 47. <clears throat> All right. Well, look at the heading that the ESV gives it. Water flowing from the temple. Interesting. Now, of course, in Revelation, there is no temple as such, no localized temple. Why? Because the whole creation is filled, is the Holy of Holies. It's filled with the presence of God. But, uh, so, but at any rate, in, in Ezekiel's language here, look at verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple south of the altar. Then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, water was, emphasis upon trickling, all right, out on the south side. Then, going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water it was ankle deep. See, the point here is this river's getting deeper and deeper. Interesting, isn't it? It starts out as a trickle. Now it's ankle deep. Verse 4, again he measured a thousand, led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again, and measured a thousand, led me through the water, it was waist deep. And again, he measured a thousand, it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And then look at this now. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? He led me back to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees. So it's not just one tree, see? Very many trees on the one side and the other, on both sides then. And, uh, and it's a life-giving river. Wherever the river goes, uh, well, the water flows into the sea and the water becomes fresh instead of salinated. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. There will be many fish, for this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. And uh, if fishermen will stand by, beside the sea from Engedi to Eniglaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Now, among other things there, certainly, even here in Ezekiel, 
we're being hearkened back to the pre-fall creation. Why? Because God separated the waters from the land and then he commanded that the fish and everything that swims in the sea would be fruitful and multiply and the sea would abound with all of these fish and so on. And so the emphasis again is always that it is this river coming from the presence of God, from the throne of God and the Lamb, that is giving life to, to all creation. And that's just a, a symbol or a picture of the fact that, that whenever a person is separated from God, they're dead. Because he is, he's the source of life, right? Um, let's see here. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. We were by nature children of wrath. You were dead. Why? Because sin separates the sinner from God. God is the source of life. So even though people who reject Christ and are just partying on, giving no thought to God at all, suppressing any truth about him that might come their way, even though they want to talk about how great their life is, they're spiritually, they're walking corpses. They're, they're dead in their hearts, minds, and soul in respect, in respect to God, all right? They're, they're like, what was the name of that? movie was there one dead men walking or something like that right that's that's what the that's what the sinner is so yeah all of this emphasis is upon the fact that god is the one who gives life and notice that in that ezekiel passage it says there was not just one tree there's many trees and they're growing on each side of the river and and kistemacher says and it, it it makes sense i think it makes sense here let's go back here See where we were there. All right. That when Revelation says, um, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, um, what he says is this singular <laughs> reference to the tree of life must be referring to a multiplicity of orchard of trees of life some on each side of the river then you see and so accessible to all accessible to 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 everyone what's the 12 kinds of fruit um well 12 is certainly a significant number in the book of revelation and all through the bible the 12 tribes of israel the 12 apostles and uh, and so on. So maybe once again, the emphasis is upon uh, fruit for everyone there, fruit for what I, I'm not, I'm not sure. And, and that's, that's one of those things that, that uh, you just kind of conclude like uh, it's, well, actually maybe the emphasis of the 12 kinds of fruit comes in the yielding its fruit each month. This is the idea of, you know, under the curse, sometimes, well, like we've got a, we've got a nice old apple tree here that gives really good apples, but only if in the springtime when that thing has blossomed and it's time for the bees to do their pollinating and so on, if the weather is all wet and rainy during that even like one week period of time, you're not going to get very many apples, right? If it's nice and sunny, then you'll get, you'll get a good crop. But in the new creation, there's none of that aspect of the curse. You know, in this present world, farmers can plant a big field, invest money into it and plant the seed and so forth. 
and something goes wrong, a drought or something like that, or a disease, and, and that's it. it. It's wiped out. So uh, when I was a teenager and I worked on my uncle's farm, one of the crops that he raised uh, there was uh, bush beans, all right? They're long string beans, but they're called bush beans because they grow the bushes lower to the ground in rows. And so, you know, we worked, you planted those and fertilized them and sometimes had to hoe weeds out of them. That, that's a real thrill, by the way. Some, have somebody hand you a hoe on a 90-degree summer day and tell you there, there's a 40-acre field there. Go hoe the weeds out of it. And that's the kind of thing that we actually did. Today, that would be called cruel and unusual punishment even for, for prisoners, right? That's a large part of our problem today. But anyway, um, the, the point is the bush beans, so they're represented from the cannery. So you're raising these for the cannery on contract. And um, they would tell you when to harvest them. They had a, a big special machine that harvested them. But he'd come and inspect. And one of the things they were looking for was uh, bug bites on the beans where a particular kind of beetle would come in and and they couldn't use them if those things got in there that whole crop could be lost so they had to watch it really close and sometimes dust them with some kind of, of pesticide but um but anyway there's the point all that stuff that we're so used to well for that matter being in a, on a 90 degree day in a 48 acre field with a hoe to hoe weeds that that's part of the curse. That's what, there won't be any of that kind of thing in, um, in, the new, in the new creation. And I think that's what all this language is about here. It yields its fruit every month, constantly, constantly there's life. There's never going to be a bad year, that, that kind of a thing. And of course, this fruit that the Lord is producing and even the leaves on the tree are said to be for the healing of the nations. That's simply another picture of, of, the, of eternal life and removal of the curse. I was just thinking there that um, Christ is obviously in this all. And I was trying to remember if there's any Old Testament passages that refer to Christ as a tree, a leafing um, tree. We know that he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now that might come in here then as well. Um, I, he's the true vine. He, he's the true Israel. That has a Isaiah backdrop, the, the vineyard. I think that's Isaiah chapter 5. But... Um, but that could be this this tree of life with the fruit and the leaves that are for the healing could also be an image then of uh, of Christ. Thought of another passage there, but I I lost it here. Um, well, maybe it'll maybe it'll come back to me. Um, but that would be another thing to look at there. Obviously, all of this healing and blessing and life and so forth, all of that is connected with, the, directly with the connection, connected with the Lamb, right? The Lamb that gives us this. And, uh, oh, I know what else I was going to tell you too. Um, the river of life. So another Old Testament background of that has to be... Um, the account of Israel in the wilderness and it's a dry and dusty land, right? And they're thirsty and they're grumbling against God and so forth. And what happens? Moses is told to strike the rock. I think, isn't that where he sinned? Maybe he struck it more than once. But anyway, what happens? Water comes gushing in the middle of the wilderness. A river comes gushing out of that rock and later on in the New Testament 
I think it's Paul that tells us, and the rock was Christ. Maybe that's in Hebrews. Anyway, the rock was Christ, and there he is. What is that? You can see why that's a river of life, because they were about to die of dehydration there. But here comes Christ giving them, from his presence, giving them this, this water. Well, that is fulfilled, of course, then here in the, in the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. All right. So the healing of the nations, the church consists of people from the elect, from every nation then in the, in the world. You see this, this curse all the time in the news, right? Racism. There's an ugly thing. What's even uglier is how people are going back and forth accusing each other. Well, you're a racist. You know, yeah, if you use a particular word of some kind with no intent whatsoever to have racism or something in mind, or prejudice, then there, these people are just like wolves ready to attack, right? You're a racist, you're going to accuse you. And then, of course, there is the wickedness of real, real racism. And, uh, and so, but, but it is in the church, it's in the church, the true church, where the reversal of the curse, the kingdom of God, the new heavens and the new earth are, the church is a microcosm. That's a good word there, a microcosm of that, a little model of the new creation, of the salvation that we have in Christ. People in this world are supposed, they're meant to be able to look at us Christians in the church and say, that's a place I want to live. There is a difference there. Something is up here. It's like they're supposed to be getting a, a, a vision, uh, a picture of the blessings that we have in the redemption that's, that's in Christ. And every time there's sin and nonsense going on in a local church, all of that is negated. All of that's negated, right? Most local churches, you know, so many talk about evangelism and missions and all those kinds of things. But you've got to start out with being the people of God. You've got to be a church where the people are born again. They really know Christ and they're living for Christ in unity, in the, the bond of peace. And they're, they're living out this new life that Christ has given. And we're not to be like, you know, the Corinthians had slid into that worldliness where Paul rebuked him and said, you know, you guys are acting like mere men. You're acting just like the rest of the world. You better, you better, you better stop it. But this kind of, see, that's where this business of, well, you know, in the church, we're just supposed to love everybody and be patient and forgiving. You know, there's old Mrs. So-and-so, and she has a reputation for being uh, kind of mean, and she's not very, it's not pleasant to be around, that kind of a thing. But, you know, we just, we just what? Well, what they mean is we just tolerate her. We just tolerate that sin in the church. That's not to be. That's not to be. A person like that is not, and we have no reason to believe that they're even a Christian, that they're even born again. But there seems to be this mentality of, well, you don't want to go there because pretty soon you won't have anybody left in your church. Well, you probably will have some left in your church, the real Christians. There might be just a remnant. There might not be that many of them, but at least you'll have a real church. So, well, this section goes on. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. 
They will see his face. We need to talk more about that next time because that's pretty incredible. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. He's not like, you're not going to be branded with 666, that's a property of the beast. We belong to the Lord. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Well, we'll plan next time to pick up at verse 3 and look at several important things there. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all of these encouraging truths. Thank you that Christ is coming again. We pray that he would come soon to a world that is really, really messed up and uh, uh, perishing. We pray, Father, that you would come and set us free from all aspects of sin and that we would soon see you face to face. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.